Very good morning to everyone here. I bring greetings from OXI, the Obstetrics and Gynec Society of Southern India. Um, all of us are uh, very familiar with uh, gestational diabetes and um, it's not out of place to say that we call Professor Seshaya the father of diabetes, diabetology. And I would fail my duty and I would not be fit to sit here as chairperson if I don't mention um, or recall Dr. Anjalakshi. Very unfortunately, she met with an accident yesterday and uh, I, but she's recovering. That's the good news. And my humble request to all of you is to pray for her speedy recovery. With this back to business, um, we are going to have a discussion on gestational diabetes. And it's a well-known fact that India is becoming the sugar factory of the world. And alarmingly, the incidence of gestational diabetes is going up. What used to be 5 to 8% has now gone on, according to DIPSI, to more than 16%, 18%. It's escalating. So now we have Dr. Avdesh Kumar Singh, who is going to enlighten on the pre-gestational diabetes, uh, uh, diabetics undergoing pregnancy. So here it has a lot of implications, how it's going to affect the pregnancy, or how it's going to affect the mother, and what's going to be the outcome and at the best what we can do to detect it at the earliest. As can uh, obstetricians, our main aim is to bring down the maternal mortality and morbidity and have a good outcome. So here we have Dr. Avlesh. A few words about him. He is the chief consultant endocrinologist and diabetologist of Sun Valley Diabetes Research Center Hospital, Gauhati. GD Hospital and Diabetes Institute, Kolkata. And he is a speaker and chairperson for API, RSSDI, and principal investigator in phase 3 4 trials. He has many publications to his um, credit. And over to Dr. Avdesh. Avdesh. Good morning. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, my job is of uh, being an opening batsman is always a difficult. But what I will going to talk is not on gestational diabetes, but on pre-gestational diabetes. Well, so if I make a very simpler classifications how to proceed with diabetes in pregnancy, we can divide into simply into two parts, pre-gestational diabetes or gestational diabetes. Pre-gestational diabetes are the patients already having either type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes. And gestational diabetes is the diabetes occurring first time during pregnancy, you all are aware about. My job is to take care of the first part, pre-gestational diabetes. Now, if you look into the magnitude of the problem, this is very recent publications in Diabetes, uh, Journal of Diabetes and Complications. On the left-hand panel, you could see Please do not confuse, there are two different colors here in the two slides here. So the blue one is the GDM incidence. If you see since 2001 to 2007, you could see a clear slope, rising slope of GDM. Whereas if you see the pre-gestational diabetes, it is fairly constant. But on the right hand panel, if you see the prevalence when it is adjusted for the age since the years of 15 years till 45, you could see then because of the rising prevalence of uh, type 2 diabetes, you could see the pre-gestational diabetes is also increasing in terms of prevalence. So this is the typical magnitude of the problem. Now if you look into the burden of the problem, there was one inquiry set from United Kingdom in 2005 way back and it was a stonish result to find out that 80% of this uh, pre-gestational diabetes had stillbirth in spite of they are having a structurally normal placentas. So that leads to find out how this pre-gestational diabetes is going uncared for. And if you look into that data, you could find out less than 40% of the patients had, you know, preconceptional counseling, 
uh, hardly a HbA1c test done six months before pregnancy and less than 40 percent were taking folic acid we all know which reduces the neural tube defect but then to avoid this kind of you know the burden there was another study set into uh, 2007 this is a prospective studies of pregestational diabetes for seven years some data is recently published it's called Atlantic Deep Study from Ireland and by giving a preconceptional counseling we could reduce down you see here this the result of this particular studies which is still ongoing we have got some interim data at six years though it is a seven year prospective study so you could see there is a you know significant reductions in maternal and perinatal mortality if you have a proper way of pre uh, you know conceptional counselings for this pregestational diabetes now the question remains is how does this is important for the uh, clinicians so if you see this is a typical rising hba1c and the prevalence of fetal anomaly in a pregestational diabetes and you know upper and lower bar is the 95 percent confidence interval and you could easily find out this you know rising slope of fetal anomaly with increasing glycemia so we need to be very careful uh, in terms of controlling blood glucose and it is essential to call these patients with uh, diabetes undergoing pregnancy to talk about how to control diabetes prior to getting conceived now this is uh, one of the meta-analysis which is looking into how pregestational diabetes is putting problems in terms of major congenital malformation and uh, you know you could easily find out from pregestational cohort meta-analysis or even a case control meta-analysis uh, you could find out the risk relative risk or odds ratio of having a major congenital malformation is you know too much higher in a PGDM what I was thought to give you the data on even a gestational diabetes it was you know traditional uh, textbook reading that gestational diabetes doesn't cause fetal anomaly except macrosomia which is absolutely a wrong concept you could find out even the gestational diabetes has got a major congenital malformation if you compare with the non-diabetic pregnancy so rising hyperglycemia is the biggest burden and we need to think about that and this is another meta-analysis recently published looking into pre-gestational and gestational diabetes. Let's not go into this minute detail, but suffice to say that if you look on the left-hand side, major abnormalities in pre-gestational diabetes are very much significant if you compare with the gestational diabetes. Now, this is a very classical slide, but I thought to show you for one reason. We know that maternal blood glucose can cross placenta, whereas uh, insulin cannot. But then... Uh, one very interesting finding which has been observed during pregnancy that the mothers are very prone to produce antibody to insulin so even human insulin is getting you know antibody in a pregnant mother and this immunoglobulin bond insulin can cross placenta and can do you know macrosomia kind of stuff and we all know that insulin doesn't cause placenta but if you give in a higher dose uh, roughly if the patients are getting more than 50 units of insulin it does crosses the placenta that was the point I thought to share with you so in summary what we have known so far that this glycemia and pregnancy can result to adverse pregnancy outcome in the first trimester it can cause embryopathy in second and third trimester it can cause macrosomia or it can cause met metabolic decompensation in mother itself now then how to take care of these pregestational diabetes so if you go into the guidelines and you will be confused since 1998 this is the first was the australian guidelines then the who's then american college of ops and gynae they have got one practice bulletin on pregestational diabetes way back in 2005 and then recently they have also published a bulletin on gestational diabetes recently in august 2013 then we have nice ida psg ada and cda so i thought to take i gone through all these guidelines and i thought that very much complicated the, the recent one and the probably easier one is the Canadian Diabetic Association guidelines and I will look into this and give you some what is there in these guidelines. This is a very simple guidelines how to manage pregestational diabetes. We need to consider phases. So if you see the gestational diabetes and the pregestational diabetes, they have got the four phases. Uh, in gestational diabetes, you have got a screening. In pregestational, you have got preconceptional counseling. And then other three steps, glycemia control during pregnancy, management in labor, and postpartum considerations are you know, almost same between pregestational and gestational diabetes with little bit of differences among them. 
I will not discuss about gestational diabetes, so I will go into my topic, which is pre-gestational diabetes, and let's talk about preconceptional counseling. If you look into the Canadian diabetic guidelines, they have got a 29 recommendation, of which the first 15 was given for pre-gestational diabetes, 14 for gestational diabetes. So this is recommendation one to two, and this is a preconception care. Uh, women of reproductive age with type one and type two diabetes should receive advice on reliable birth control. They need to understand the glycemic control prior to pregnancy, as, as I told you, the burden with fetal anomalies <coughs> uh, uh, before conception. The impact of BMI, very important on pregnancy outcomes. We know that if the mother has got high BMI, they are tend to produce more gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, or adverse perinatal outcome. Need to supplement folic acid, need to stop potentially embryopathic drugs. I will come in little details about that. We also need to discuss with the patients about their irregular menses. Polycystic patients who are started on metformin and TJD should advise that your fertility may improve and be warned about pregnancy. So these are some basic educations about preconception care. Before attempting to become pregnant, they should have a preconceptional counseling that includes the dietary management and optimal diabetes control. What should be the control? We must strive to attain a preconceptional SBO1C of less than 7%. If you look into the earlier ACOG guidelines, they had looked for 6%. That was probably too tough and was causing much more hypoglycemia in the mother. So now this has been set. This is current 2013 addition into that Canadian Diabetic Association guidelines. And once we strive for a preconceptional HB1C of less than 7%, to avoid, you could see a spontaneous abortion, congenital anomalies, preeclampsia, progression of retinopathy in pregnancy. <clears throat> they must be supplemented with 5 milligram of poly folic acid at least three months of preconception. And let me tell you that folic acid requirement during pregnancy to avoid neural tube defects is as low as 400 microgram. So even a multivitamin, multivitamin you know, capsules or tablets containing at least 0.4 to 1 milligram of folic acid is suffice enough to you know, prevent neural tube defect in this pregestational diabetes. Discontinue the embryopathic drugs, in particular AC inhibitor and ARB. Uh, you, this is very fascinating data that normally you tend to, you know, stop embryopathic drug before conception, but for AC inhibitor and ARB, they are much more dangerous during pregnancy rather than before pregnancy. This is a very interesting fact. And recently, statins also has been added into this list of uh, embryopathic drugs by Canadian Diabetes Guidelines. Preferably, you should switch your patients from those who are on oral tablets to, to the insulin. And this is, you know, a much more debatable topic. But for pregestational diabetes, by and large, consensus suggests that you should shift into insulin. Somebody can discuss about metformin and gliburide in gestational diabetes, but this is not the case for pregestational diabetes. And essentially, all patients should be put on insulin. Well, so patients with polycystic ovary may continue with metformin for ovulation induction. And there are also data to suggest that you can continue up to the first trimester. Even there are pregnancies which continued entirely on, on metformin without any, you know, major problems with metformin. We must assess about the complications, whether it is an eye or it is a kidney. So one should go for ophthalmological evaluations by eye care specialist. We must screen them from CKD or from macroalbuminuria. We should go for albumin creatinine ratio. Look for preeclampsia. These are some basic recommendations for preconceptional diabetes. So now, if you make out a checklist for this pregestational diabetes and what we should do in preconception, as we discussed, strive for SB1C of less than 7% if safe and not causing hypoglycemia, assess and manage any complications like retinopathy or nephropathy, switch to insulin, preferably if patients are on any oral agents, supplement folic acid, because conventionally we have got five milligram available in India, but 400 microgram is enough. Three month preconception to the 12 week post conception. Discontinue potential embryopathic drugs like AC inhibitor or ARB and statin as well. So that was about preconceptional counseling. Now let's come to the glycemic control during pregnancy. This is essentially the same with pregestational and gestational diabetes. Individualize the treatment, but what is, has been added here in Canadian guidelines that now they are using intensive insulin therapy because a striving HbA1c is low, less than 7% is not a joke. And if you see the target value, the fasting is 95, one hour prandial is 140, two hour postprandial is 120. We all are aware about that. 
But where from this data has been generated is a little bit of controversy, though this is the most recent guidelines, but if you see even some meta-analysis published, they're looking into that we want to reduce the macrosomia, even you may have to lower the fasting blood glucose to less than 90, not the 95, as suggested with the several guidelines. Then be prepared to raise these targets if there is a hypoglycemia. Discuss about importance of self-monitoring of blood glucose, both pre- and postprandial, you know, targets should be achieved. Uh, one should not hesitate to use newer insulins because we know that a SPART and Lispro insulins, these are uh, rapid analogs and now they are in category B, uh, like human insulin. Same is with the Detemid insulin, which is also category B. Now two years back in 2012, they got the category B. They also have recommended glycine, but let me tell you, these are off-level indications. Glycine has not yet get approval uh, during pregnancy, but I mean, one can, some patients, those who are well controlled on glycine might continue during pregnancy, and observational data doesn't suggest anything wrong with the glycine as well. I'm sure sooner if you have got any prospective trial with glycine, which is they are going on, they will also get category B approval. So individualize the managements with basal and bolus. As I said, you can use a SPART or Lispro. Glulysine has not been approved as a bolus insulin. In basal insulin, Detemir has been approved apart from NPH, and glycine is looking a uh, good molecule to use. Encourage patients to self-monitoring blood glucose, as I mentioned, and this is your target of fasting 95, 1 hour, 140, 2 hour, 120. Now coming back to the last two stages, management in labor and postpartum considerations. This is important. This may be a little bit different between, uh, you know, pre-gestational and gestational diabetes. One has to consider that women should be closely monitored and their blood glucose should be between 72 and 126. This is, you know, uh, have been done to avoid neonatal hypoglycemia because if the mother has got a higher blood glucose during the labor, there is a propensity to have a neonatal hypoglycemia because of this hyperglycemia in the mother. That's why target has been made much more stricter to maintain between 70 to 126 milligram per DL. And women should receive adequate glucose during labor in order to meet the high energy requirement. This is very important step during labor. Uh, we also look into the postpartum stage and, uh, you know, this metformin and glyburide may be continued during breastfeeding. Hardly uh, concentration of glibenclamide and metformin has been seen in breast milk, if any of you give, give very high dose of metformin and glyburide, but then uh, you should encourage them to use during even uh, lactation. Women with type 1 diabetes needs a special consideration. They need to undergo the thyroid testing by measuring TSH test at 6 to 8 week postpartum. All women should be encouraged to breastfeed since this may reduce the offspring's obesity, especially in the setting of maternal obesity. So what is the checklist during labor and delivery? Make the blood glucose target between 70 to 126. Use the glucose during the labor because mother needs it. And there are several protocols, the easier protocols which fits into your patient's profile. This may be a little bit different between a gestational diabetes and pre-gestational diabetes. IV dextrose with IV insulin may be helpful during this. So this is a check checklist, adjust insulin, avoid hypoglycemia, encourage women to breastfeed. You can continue metformin, glyburide, screen for postpartum thyroiditis in type 1 diabetes, measure TSS 6 to 8 weeks postpartum. Thank you very much for your patience here.